If you've been wondering what your ESR blood test results really mean, or if you're curious about why your doctor keeps ordering this test, then you're in the right place. This is a blood test that might be done if there is concern for infection, rheumatoid arthritis, or if your doctor is just trying to figure things out. It can certainly be an important data point that guides decision making, but it's important to also understand its limitations. We're diving deep into everything you need to know about your ESR, also known as the sedimentation rate today. We're going to break down exactly what it means, how it's interpreted, and what it can and can't tell us about your health. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology. Let's get started. All right, so let's jump right in. First off, what exactly is the ESR? The ESR stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate and is considered an inflammatory marker. Technically speaking, the ESR is simply a measure of how quickly your red blood cells settle at the bottom of a tube of blood over the course of an hour. The faster they settle, the higher the levels of inflammation in your body, thus the higher the sedimentation rate. But what's really going on here? Well, when your body is dealing with inflammation, whether it's from an infection, an autoimmune condition, cancer, or even trauma, your liver produces specific proteins known as acute phase reactants. It produces these acute phase reactants as a result of certain chemical signals it receives from damaged tissue to the body. You see, when we have inflammation in the body, regardless of what causes it, the inflammation leads to tissue damage. The damaged tissues then release chemicals that cue the liver to produce acute phase proteins. These acute phase proteins then change the electrical charge on the surface of the red blood cell, causing them to become stickier and clump together. It's pretty cool, right? Clumped red blood cells fall to the bottom of a test tube a lot faster than unclumped red blood cells, leading to a higher ESR. So how do we actually perform the test? Pretty simple. We draw your blood and place it in a special tube, leaving it to sit for an hour. During that time, the red blood cells gradually fall to the bottom and the rate at which they do is then measured. And then you have your sedimentation rate. It's worth noting that this test doesn't measure any specific chemical or protein. It's purely a physical phenomenon that we're observing. So you can see how ESR is actually an indirect measure of the level of inflammation in the body. So what does your ESR actually tell us? Despite this test being commonly run in our clinics, hospitals, and urgent cares, how we interpret this result is often not explained or is wildly oversimplified. The short answer, it can either be helpful or it can tell us nothing at all. I know that sounds frustrating, but let me explain. First, let's talk about what's considered a normal ESR. If you've had this test done before, you might have noticed that anything above 20 or 30 millimeters per hour, depending on the lab, is flagged as abnormal. However, this doesn't necessarily mean it's abnormal for you. Your ESR can be influenced by several different factors, including your age and gender. So for example, women and older adults naturally tend to have higher ESRs, so a result flagged as abnormal might actually be normal for them. It's not uncommon for a woman in her 60s, 70s, or 80s to have an ESR result flagged by the lab as abnormal, but in fact, it's normal for her. We have a fairly simple math equation that we can use in this situation that can tell us if the ESR is actually elevated, but there are other scenarios where it's not as easy to calculate. Factors like your body mass index or BMI, metabolic syndrome, or even smoking can elevate your ESR. These are less straightforward to account for and we don't have a simple equation to adjust for these influences, which can then make interpreting the result a bit tricky. Okay, so let's say you've had your blood tested and we've considered all these other factors and your ESR is still elevated. What now? What does it mean? The first thing your doctor will consider is how high your ESR actually is. This is a test where we don't simply consider positive or negative, but how high or how low. Numbers in the 50s or 60s or higher are definitely cause for further investigation. But equally important are your symptoms. I always stress how you can't separate the person from the blood work. Your symptoms are crucial in helping us interpret what your ESR actually means for you. For example, if you're experiencing joint pain, fatigue, or rashes, and you have an elevated ESR that's two or three times that of normal, this might point towards an autoimmune condition. On the other hand, if you're feeling well and your ESR is just slightly elevated, it might not be a cause for concern at all. 
Now, how do we use the ESR in rheumatology? If you've ever been suspected of having an autoimmune condition or have seen a rheumatologist, chances are you've had your ESR checked. But remember, the ESR alone doesn't diagnose anything. It's a general marker of inflammation, so it can be elevated in a variety of conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, to lupus, to vasculitis. In fact, the ESR is most useful when we can track it over time, looking for trends rather than focusing on a single result. That's why your primary care doctor might test your ESR, and then your rheumatologist might repeat the test a few months later to see if there's a pattern. In rheumatology, the ESR is used to monitor autoimmune inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. It helps us assess whether your arthritis is active and whether your treatment is working. But in other conditions like lupus, Sjogren's, or scleroderma, it can be less reliable. And in these situations, we really have to take everything going on with you into account. I want to make special mention of a rheumatic condition where we put a lot of importance on the ESR, and that is PMR, or polymyalgia rheumatica. This is an inflammatory condition that can affect the joint structures around our shoulders and hips, and can cause us to have weakness to the point that we can't walk. It happens in those over 65 years old, and a hallmark is an elevated ESR. So much so that without the high ESR, we really should be considering other things. You guys know I love giving y'all some food for thought to think about in your own situation and take to your doctor's visits to keep these conversations going. If you have an autoimmune or inflammatory condition, find out if the ESR is one of the tests your doctor is regularly checking and start tracking it. As I mentioned, a one-time result doesn't always tell us a whole lot, but trends can tell us a lot more. If you haven't had your ESR checked in a while, ask your doctor, is my ESR something that should be checked and why or why not? This can be very helpful in understanding your doctor's point of view on your condition and how they are approaching it. If you are tracking your ESR already, one of the most important pieces of data is going to be, what was my ESR when I was first diagnosed? When we are first diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, we are often in a flare. During flares, we often have high levels of inflammation, and whether or not our ESR is elevated at this moment in time can tell us a lot about what we can expect from our lab results in the future. If your ESR was high when you were first diagnosed and you had a lot of inflammation, then you can expect your ESR to be a marker that goes up and down with your disease. If your ESR was normal when you were first diagnosed and you had a lot of symptoms of inflammation, then you might expect your ESR to not be as telling as you learn the flavor of your particular autoimmune disease. If you've had persistently elevated ESRs and haven't been getting any answers, it's worth asking your doctor if there could be other reasons it might be elevated. Do you fall into any of the categories we discussed that are known to cause high ESRs? We all, patients Patients and doctors love to hang our hat on it as proof that there either is or isn't inflammation going on. But as we discussed, like all my other labs, it has to be taken in context with the person and tracking trends will tell you a lot more than just one result. If you'd like to learn more about another inflammatory marker test that we often use, the CRP, then let me know in the description box. Honestly, I thought I'd already covered it, but when I looked at my videos, I realized I had it, so it's already on my list. If you are interested in how you can work with me and you happen to be in Texas, California, Florida, or Tennessee, then check out the link in the description box. I'm now open for second opinions. Thanks so much for joining me today. Today. If this was helpful at all, please like, share it with anyone you think could benefit from this information, and subscribe. It really helps us get in front of more eyeballs, and I'll see you next time.